Schaefer in beautiful Portland, Maine. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Um, Stroud Water, we'll do a little infomercial first and then we'll get right down to business. Um, we have offices in Portland, Maine, Atlanta, and Nashville, and we are a national healthcare consulting firm and we serve exclusively the healthcare industry. Um, today, you are going to be hearing from two of our leaders in the affiliation and um, uh, capital planning space. Jeff Summer is a practice leader of our capital planning and access practice line and the affiliations and partnership practice. His focus over the last uh, 18, 20 years has been assisting clients with strategic development and the successful execution of business development opportunities. In, um, and Jeff is in our Portland office. Uh, Douglas Johnson is with us from Nashville and he's been with Stroudwater since 2014, bringing more than 25 years of transaction, business development, and financial accounting experience to the firm. Um, he works with sensitive and complex transactions and helps prepare clear, accurate, and management-focused deliverables. And that's Doug in Nashville. So now that you've heard about us, um, I'd like to find out who we have joining us today. So I'm going to... Um, launch a poll that you can do right on your desktop. Um, what best describes your role within the organization? All right. It looks like um, most people are on the board or serving in leadership of the hospital on the phone today. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jeff Summer. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, pleased to be with you all today. Um, Doug and I will spend the better part of the next hour sharing with you some uh, lessons learned from the field and some of the insights we've gleaned from our national practice. Um, one of the things that we have seen nationally, uh, and it is a painful exercise, uh, certainly um, when we have clients that go through this is um, kind of public upwellings of anxiety uh, and disapproval that can occur um, when there is um, open disagreement uh, and dispute between a county and a hospital board or a district uh, and, and hospital board. Um, generally speaking, um, it's a, th that's a fairly common structure and that st structure functions reasonably well, um, but there are times where the inherent frictions of having two different boards with certainly uh, board members okay. sense overlapping okay. responsibilities um, can, can rise to the surface and become a source of public uh, controversy. And you can see there's an assortment of, of headlines here that we've gleaned from uh, local uh, news reports around the country. Um, what we want to talk with you about today is just understanding a little bit more about how these uh, disputes come uh, to become public disputes and what are some approaches to manage um, the frictions, the differences uh, of opinion and perspective that exist when you have two different boards with different fiduciary responsibilities but some overlapping um, uh, responsibility themselves. Uh, and a couple of quick, quick takeaways. First of all, we happen to be in a very dynamic healthcare environment um, where hospital and health system risk profiles um, are changing and the ability to manage uh, strategic risks is uh, being undermined by larger forces in the industry. Um, one of the, the takeaways we've had from our work nationally is that um, the strategic risk profile of an organization can change and evolve over a number of years, but it can that that uh, evolution or transformation of the risk profile can go undiagnosed and untreated, and that's where we see clients of ours really really having some difficulty. Um, relationships are key. Developing trust and ensuring that there's a mechanism for communication, appropriate communication between the boards, uh, is really essential. Uh, and that mechanism and regular communication really is 
um, the, the foundational element of building working relationships and forging trust. One of the other things that we've learned um, from experience is that uh, often these disagreements are highly charged emotionally. People have lived in the community for multiple generations. Their family may have been involved in founding the hospital or perhaps um, had a, a, a forefather who was a, 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 a stalwart uh, practitioner in town. And these things become part of folks' identity and uh, much bigger issues. And emotions can really uh, start to rule the day. One of the essential things that needs to occur is that we downgrade emotions by dealing with as much objective fact and analysis as we can. Uh, and then once we're able to do that, um, developing a shared vision for what the delivery system locally should look like is really critical um, and, and moving beyond some of the disagreements. Um, lastly, when you are in a situation where you do have public disputes or disagreements, or even if it's not public, it's just become a distraction within the, the workings of the either board, um, it's very easy to take your eye off the ball in terms of operating performance. And that is the um, critical currency of, of any healthcare organization. Um, and so it's important to, to not get distracted. Um, Doug is going to walk you through some industry trends um, just to share with you some of the, the backdrop um, and why it's such a challenging environment. Good. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, I will spend just a minute to chat a little bit about some um, sort of prevailing industry trends. It, a little bit sobering, but um, it's really an interesting and exciting time to be part of, of healthcare because so many things are happening. Um, and you know, these, these, interesting, these, these industry trends are creating significant challenges for all healthcare providers. Uh, I'm on slide number six uh, that, that shows essentially uh, what's happening in the, in the consumer environment. I mean, you'll, you'll, you note here that um, you know, consumers and, and patients are carrying more of the load. Uh, what's what we're experiencing now is that people are shopping for care, um, and you'll see in this chart that that workers' earnings and overall inflation are far outpacing. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, that health insurance premiums and workers' contributions to those premiums are far outpacing uh, the growth of workers' earnings and, and the overall inflation. And essentially, what we're seeing is that only the sickest. Uh, only the sickest patients are finding their way into the hospitals. We have uh, declining volumes because people are deferring care, uh, declining revenues because services are moving into into less costly venues, and we'll chat a little bit more about that uh, in a second. But all of these things are, are pretty well documented. Um, I'm on slide seven. Uh, if you look at um, what's happening, not just with Medicare margins, uh, but also, uh, I mean, margins across the board, and this is this is a pretty significant headwind for healthcare providers. Um, you know, Medicare reimbursement continues to decline. Um, this is obviously a problem uh, because Medicare rolls will continue to increase as the baby boomers age into this into this category. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans continue to increase their presence and, and, and increase their roles significantly. Um, and many of the, the commercial reimbursement methodologies are tied to these Medicare rates. Um, and essentially what, what healthcare providers are going to need to be able to do is to survive essentially in a Medicare world. Um, and if you flip to uh, the next slide, uh, which is slide eight, um, so Moody's rating agency highlighted uh, uh, this um, these challenges very recently. I mean, essentially, um, you know, providers are pretty do, are doing a pretty good job of fixing their cost structures, but we all know that you can't cut your way to, pros, to prosperity, um, and it's difficult for for providers to to find volume growth when more and more services are migrating out of the acute care setting and into more efficient ambulatory care settings. Um, and I think, you know, what you're going to see into the future uh, is continued uh, margin suppression, just as, as Moody's has highlighted. And again, this is an important uh, point to make because uh, all of our not-for-profit providers uh, need to be paying attention to their risk profile and to their credit profile because it, 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 it directly impacts their cost of capital. 
Um, and I really believe that this that this margin suppression uh, will continue uh, so long as providers continue to redesign and implement new care models, um, because really that's that's what's that's what's driving uh, these new care models, the the the, the, the redesign uh, of of where care is provided. Uh, as these margins continue to suppress, we need to change the way we provide services. Uh, I'm on slide nine now. Uh, I mean, so essentially here you see the fallout from the changing industry dynamic. Um, if you don't, if if we don't change and adapt and and repurpose, you end up falling by the wayside. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting that most of the closures are occurring in non Medicaid expansion states, but that's certainly not the rule as you look at this map. Um, and the other thing that I thought was in, was interesting about about these the dynamics of these of these closures is uh, it's pretty equally distributed between rural facilities and urban facilities. So I'm on slide 10. Uh, obviously, Texas has not escaped uh, the closure epidemic. Um, you see on this map, and 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 it, again, fairly equal distri distribution between the rural and the urban providers. I mean, just because you're big doesn't mean that you're not at risk. And, and just because you're small means that you're at risk. And we're gonna chat for in a, in a minute about the value proposition for some of the, the smaller community providers. Um, on slide 11, here's a, a map that essentially shows um, you know, the current state, the, the current location and the current sort of volume of critical access and, and pay for performance, the PPS, uh, sorry, prospective payment system hospitals, um, the acute care hospitals throughout the state. Um, so slide number 12 is, is really interesting because uh, obviously providing value uh, to, to patients and to customers is essential to your hospital's viability. This, this is an interesting chart because several years ago, uh, CMS started keeping track of what they refer to as their total performance scores. Uh, so this chart essentially graphs uh, all of the hospitals in Texas um, and based on their, their performance scores, the, the, their HCAP scores, their, their core measure scores, essentially the scores that, that measure quality. Um, and it also measures the spend uh, per Medicare patient. How efficient are you in your in your providing of care and, and in your cost structure? Uh, and so essentially, what we've done here is we've entered into the world of pay for performance. Uh, if you're not focused on efficiency, on cost effectiveness, on quality and value, then really you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so just briefly, so if you look at the average performance uh, at the at the total performance score. Ideally, your hospital and each of these circles represents a hospital. And the larger the circle, essentially, the larger the hospital from a revenue perspective. Uh, and we highlighted a few here. So obviously, uh, Houston Methodist Hospital is a very large uh, regional provider. Uh, that, that it's a larger circle because it's, it has a, a larger revenue base. Um, and then Brownfield Regional Medical Center, a smaller community hospital. Um, so obviously it's a, it's a smaller revenue base for so a smaller circle, but each of these facilities is above the average total performance score line um, for the national performance scores, which is good. You need to be above that line. You need to be a good, a high quality provider or you'll struggle to um, um, uh, negotiate with, with the payers for, the, for their covered lives. Uh, they also are to the right of the average spending per Medicare patient nationally. So these two hospitals both both demonstrate the ability to, to provide efficient cost-effective care and at a high value. So ideally you want to be in that in that quadrant where you're providing uh, good quality care in a very cost-effective way. And if you're not, then you need to find your way into that quadrant quickly. I'm on slide number 13. Uh, it's no secret that industry consolidation is happening. Um, providers are aligning into regional hubs. They're, they're trying to create scale and a more significant market presence. Um, you know, small community hospitals and the large regional tertiaries have a role to play. I, I mentioned earlier uh, that I wanted that I would touch on this, but 
from our perspective, from Stroudwater's perspective, these, these community hospitals have a role and a real value proposition <clears throat> that they bring to this industry consolidation effort. Uh, if you think about it, the, 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 the smaller community independent standalone hospital, they provide a, a they're a low cost provider. They, they have a low cost setting. They provide good quality and personalized care. Uh, they keep people close to home. Uh, and that's their real value proposition. They're an important part of managing care along an entire continuum uh, of care. Um, you know, one of the things that was with a client recently, as we had discussions, uh, a smaller community hospital, as we had discussions with a large regional provider uh, who was doing their best to take market share from this, this, this smaller community hospital service area, uh, we pointed out pretty pretty clearly that they were taking this community hospital's $5,000 patients and putting them in $20,000 beds, essentially, uh, was the analogy that we were able to, attempt to demonstrate to them. Uh, the, so keep in mind, there is a real value proposition. There is a cost effectiveness and a high quality component to these small community hospitals. And, and the larger regional tertiaries are starting to recognize that. Um, there's also consolidation uh, within, you know, the, within this, the, this vertical integration that's happening among strategic players like the CVS and, 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 and Aetna and Optum, DaVita and Humana and Walmart. And these, these vertical integration strategies are, disrupt, are, are really disruptive to the historical care patterns and care settings of, of, of hospitals. Um, so, you know, as we deal with these disruptions, it's, it's all the more important to have a good strategic plan uh, and again, uh, a, a, you know, to the extent that you can provide good cost-effective care in a good quality setting, uh, you'll be able to continue to play a role uh, in, in providing health care. You know, the drivers behind consolidation and new, con and new combinations, we, we've touched on, on many of these already. Um, but essentially, you, you have more and more services that are moving out of the acute care setting and into an ambulatory setting. And you've got patients who are deferring procedures, patients who are shopping for care because they're carrying more more of the load. And 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 really, that's that's what these new disruptive alignments between uh, vertical players are are trying to to cap to to capitalize on uh, because consumers are providing uh, because consumers are participating a lot more intimately in in how they in how they pursue their care and then how they and how they pay for their care. Um, I'm on slide number 14. You know the hospital systems, you know, typically are are clustered around your large suburban areas, but these regional systems are strategically expanding their reach. You know, they're looking to expand their market reach. They're looking to increase uh, the number of covered lives within within their systems. Uh, so I think you'll see you'll see these strategic alignments uh, continue to expand. Uh, and it's it's not just within a small geographic area. So let's uh, I'm I'm on slide 16 now. Let's uh, of course if 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 all of this is not enough, uh, you also you in in a lot when we start talking about uh, county and district owned hospitals, you need to add on a few more layers of of complexity and some of the challenges. Uh, that are associated with with this type of, of a governance structure. Now, on this slide, these are very broad based points. Um, every every county owned hospital or district owned hospital has enabling legislation uh, that that created those 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 organizations and those governance structures. And and your own enabling legislation is going to have some pretty unique provisions that govern what you that. Uh, what you're able to do. So uh, I'll say it now, and I'll probably say it a few more times. Uh, consult your enabling legislation when you start uh, considering uh, options and considering strategic alternatives going forward. Um, but just quickly, you know, multiple layers of governance and responsibilities sometimes will blur the lines of accountability. Um, we're going to we're going to touch on that when we when we look at a couple of case studies in a, in a few minutes. Um, sometimes political agendas. Uh, and poor communication will uh, will undermine effective board oversight uh, at at the hospital. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes we run into 
uh, elected officials who uh, sometimes will count votes as opposed to do what's best in the best interest of the hospital, um, which can, which, you know, again, that's that's something that that's solved by good communication, by good education around um, about, around industry trends and 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 what makes a, a the provision of healthcare effective. Um, sometimes uh, the public uh, conflict spills over into public debate, um, which will sometimes discourage capable uh, board nominees uh, and, and discourage them from, from participating in the governance of the hospital. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, um, you know, hospitals are not allowed, government owned or district owned hospitals are not permitted to expand outside of their district boundary. Uh, and this limits their ability to compete effectively in the service area. And again, I remind you, uh, consult your enabling legislation because there may or may not be a provision in there um, that prohibit that, that that precludes you from from expanding outside of a defined area, um, and you know, it's not it's it's not what a what any hospital or or healthcare organization wants to go through. But in some cases, uh, a bankruptcy proceeding can be strategic and can help to preserve the assets of and and the and the continued operation of a hospital. Um, but sometimes there are some jurisdictions or authority-owned hospitals that are not allowed to. Uh, um, uh, file for bankruptcy, and again, uh, it, it's important to have transact to to have good counsel that can help you uh, appreciate uh, the the provisions of your enabling legislation, and as to whether or not that that is a strategy a viable strategy or not. Um, I'm on slide 17, um, just a few more uh, uh, challenges that pertain to county and district-owned hospitals. Uh, they're, they're subject to open meeting laws. Which sometimes will make it really difficult to set a strategic path forward uh, because it, it has to happen in, in a public setting. Um, we, what we see fairly often is that as a tax support can mask actual financial and operational struggles of a hospital, and I, I, you know, I think this happens a lot uh, in in places like Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Pennsylvania, sort of in in the in the oil and gas states that. That get a, um, a pretty strong mill levy and and benefit from uh, the royalties associated with with the gas and oil, and that will mask oftentimes the the the, the weakness in the balance sheet of a, of a of a small community hospital. Um, you know, eroding operating performance creates financial exposure uh, for the taxpayers and compromises a public asset. Because at the end of the day, if if that public hospital, if if that county or district owned hospital uh, gets into a bad spot. It's 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 that county or district that ends up being um, responsible for the for the the the, the financial results of that. And um, you know, essentially, when that happens, the county the the county uh, the county of the district hospital essentially becomes everyone's business, uh, and it's a complicated business and a critical community resource. Uh, so it's so it's that's why it's important to make sure um, that there's good accountability. Uh, between the, the hospital governing board uh, and, and the district or, or county governing board. Um, so with that, let me let me toss it back quickly to Jeff. Uh, he'll introduce some of the case studies, uh, and, and we'll we'll proceed from there. Thank thank you, Doug. Um, so what we wanted to do was was share with you some of the lessons learned from our practice um, nationally with. County-owned, district-owned, uh, and authority-owned hospitals. Um, relative to the state of Texas, we've worked with numerous districts and authorities over the last decade. Um, you know that the these entities, some of them are strong and vibrant, and those ones tend to have fewer issues. Uh, part of that is, um, you know, good operating results and good performance tend to allow folks to. Um, all kind of bask in that success. And it's not to say that there aren't challenges even in organizations that are um, uh, well operating and well positioned, but that they have the resources and the organizational capability to, to address those. Where we often find our value um, to really make a difference in communities is with organizations that are struggling. Um, and 
Um, some of those um, may have this kind of split governance and may have disagreements between um, a district board and a hospital board, but ultimately have been successful at arriving at rational, prudent decisions and have been able to move beyond um, those disagreements and um, disputes. We, we have worked in a couple of instances where things have been even more challenging. And um, for whatever reason, and there's a, a number of factors that play in that we'll, we'll talk about, um, those entities have not been able to overcome the distrust. And ultimately, whether they reach a, a good outcome or a poor outcome, um, along that journey, they're destroying significant community value. And when we talk about community value, we mean trust and reputation of the hospital, their ability to retain high quality clinical staff, management staff, support staff. Um, and so all of that can become a casualty, uh, unintended, of the, the thoughts of um, the, the key bodies that oversee that hospital and their zeal to protect that asset. Uh, and so it can be critical to step back. The case studies on the following pages, while none of them are Texas case studies, um, we think they do a nice job of highlighting some of the experiences and lessons learned. And so wanted to share them with you to illustrate some alternative paths that um, different entities have, have chosen. There are some key differentiators, as I mentioned, between communities that can work through their differences, whether those have become public or not, and those that, that are unable to do so. Uh, and we want to share those with you. Um, the first case study uh, we labeled Western Community Hospital. All of, all of these case studies will be blinded. In this case, they had a, a not-for-profit hospital that was owned by the county. Um, there was a, a board, a hospital board, and uh, obviously you had the, the county commissioners that had oversight of the asset. But operations had been turned over to the 501c3 board, which leased the, the facility from the county. Um, we were retained um, by the county to assess the feasibility of the hospital's strategic plan. Um, and in this case, what I would say is that both boards missed an opportunity to objectively evaluate that plan inside the cone of confidentiality um, and develop a, a um, task force, if you will, to evaluate those issues. Now, sunshine laws can complicate that depending upon the jurisdiction. Many jurisdictions do have exemptions for uh, competitive or sensitive strategic information. Um, but in this case, um, that conversation didn't happen um, between the county commissioners and the hospital board. They were not listening to each other. So they hired us as an outside objective uh, advisor um, on behalf of the county to evaluate the plan. Um, and the challenge with the plan was that <clears throat> this had been a two hospital market um, the hospitals had, had merged, um, but they still had two campuses. And it was recognized that, that over the long haul, to be operationally efficient, they needed to consolidate on a single campus. And so the, the hospital, the 501c3, had a multi-phased project to build over the course of, I think it was seven or eight years, a replacement campus. The challenge was really twofold. One, the way they had phased the replacement had a lot of upfront cost investment and debt service incurred, but very little uh, incremental revenue. Uh, and so they, they added debt service, they added additional operating cost, but did not have additional operating revenue that would flew out of those investments. Those investments were necessary. They were site uh, preparation, infrastructure driven, et cetera, but um, it put the hospital in a more precarious position to now be carrying that debt and that additional operating expense. At the same time that occurred, the hospital uh, in, in endured a uh, downturn in its operating performance. Um, and so uh, you ended up with really um, uh, your debt capacity being somewhat depleted by the initial construction phase, which had all this infrastructure and then duplicative cost on a separate standalone um, cardiac center. Uh, and then you had um, cash flow becoming uh, less. Um, and effectively, they became stuck. Um, and we came in and we evaluated the plan and, and essentially said, you're not performing to target when you embarked upon this journey of the phased uh, replacement. And um, 
you've got this additional difficulty now of uh, the incremental debt service. And so um, we, we um, uh, question the feasibility of the, of the plan. Um, our analysis and finding was in fact then validated um, by the rating agencies, which downgraded them uh, two notches at the same time. Now the 501c3 board, not without merit, said all of this public discussion and strife and debate has been negative on the hospital and its reputation, and they were right. And it's it's one of the reasons why I would point to the missed opportunity of of coming together to address these concerns before they became public. Uh, and neither entity, the 501c3 board or the county commissioners, were able to do that. I guess the, the, the least worst outcome in this case was the fact that while there was public debate and dispute, they ultimately ended up not going forward and digging a deeper hole on a, on a, on a plan that was not feasible. Uh, they stepped back and were able then to together um, look at their strategic options and say, how do we best serve the community? In this case, their decision um, was to um, solicit a joint venture partner to help fund the replacement hospital uh, project in the new campus. Um, part of the outcome of that was that they got a, a um, well-endowed community foundation as a result of that joint venture arrangement. Doug, do you want to take over the next sure. case study? Sure, yeah, so here's another interesting example in the southeast, uh, a standalone community hospital um, who uh, recently, within the last couple of years, became exposed to an unfunded long-term liability, essentially a, a situation where there was not good communication uh, between the hospital authority board and the county courthouse, uh, and, and, a, and a hospital that began to struggle financially and operationally. Um, you know, fortunately, the county agreed to step in and, and, and to issue some debt on behalf of the hospital. But, I mean, obviously, as a result of that, um, you know, the 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 the, the county commissioners, um, you know, became far more interested in 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 the in what was going on uh, over at the hospital. Uh, the good thing was that there was extensive communication between the county courthouse and the hospital boardroom. Uh, which led to, you know, a cooperative initiative, um, and so eventually uh, we were able to help this this authority board, which was appointed by the county commissioners, and the county commissioners. We we went through a a strategic options exercise um, that was that was well documented, that was participated in by both by both uh, constituencies. Uh, there were frequent updates. Um, and essentially, we, they, they came up with, we helped them devise a common fact base and then guided them to put together and to come up with a, a shared vision and, and, a, and a path forward uh, that would preserve, uh, uh, that would make the best attempt to preserve health care in the community um, and, and to, to, to get things back uh, on, a, on a better trajectory. Um, at the time, the hospital was trending towards closure within it, it, no more than six months. You know, we did a we did a 13 week um, and, a, and a 26 week cash needs analysis, uh, and the, and the trend they were they were trending uh, poorly. Um, we helped them with some interim uh, operational resources, uh, put together uh, an operations improvement plan that they are that that they are executing on with the help of some of the resources that Stradwater was able to provide to them. Um, interestingly enough, on the last two months, uh, so they they are coming up on 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 twelve months into this initiative and and have had two of the the strongest operating and cash flow months that they have had uh, in in several years. So their trajectory is is much more improved. The good thing about that is now that they have they have far more options. Uh, they are chatting now with a large regional uh, provider uh, about perhaps um, partnering with them and becoming part of the, of of their organization. Um, I mean, you'll know here we we put in quote the hospital certainly is not out of the woods, um, but what they were able to accomplish through good coordination between the hospital authority board and and the and the and the county uh, commissioners 
um, that collectively they were able to to do it to put forth an initiative that put the hospital in a better position to have more options going forward. Uh, and that's this is a this is a scenario in a, in a hospital that 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 has a, a much better future uh, now that they've um, put themselves back in a, in a better place. Um, this next one, which is slide 22, this this uh, Southern Coastal Medical Center, I would put this in the category of, of best practice scenario, um, and I I won't say it's it's be it's 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 specifically because of what Stroudwater did. Um, it's it was a combination of the resources that Stroudwater brought to the table and the leadership that eventually um, worked its way to the top. Uh, within the within a, within multiple organizations, you had a you had a, a publicly elected hospital district. Uh, you had a medical center board that essentially ran the hospital, uh, and then you also had a very influential hospital foundation board. Uh, so you had three very strong uh, governing groups um, that historically were not able to were, were certainly not rowing in the same direction, um, and then you had a a pretty intrusive and and toxic local media, uh, where I, you know, we refer to them, I guess, as rabble rousers, would come and stir the pot. Interestingly enough, these rabble rousers tended to be former uh, elected district board members who were not able to accomplish their narrow agendas. They would get elected uh, to this district board with an agenda of, of things to accomplish uh, that typically were pretty narrow in scope. Uh, and and they weren't able to accomplish it. So as, when they would come off the board, they would just start throwing rocks in the newspaper. Anyways, all of those things sort of contributed to a very uh, a dysfunctional environment. But a couple of years ago, uh, they ended up with some really good, strong leadership at each of those three levels: at, at, at the at the at the district board level, at the hospital uh, um, board level, and also at the foundation level. And these three chairs got together. Uh, and they created this collaborative committee, and they engaged uh, Stroudwater, they engaged Jeff and I and, and some others on our team to help them develop uh, a common fact base and come up with a shared vision for the future of the hospital because they knew that all around them were these industry pressures and, and, and disruptions that needed to be dealt with, uh, that they needed to get above sort of the, 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 the bickering and rabble-rousers and start dealing with some of these more broader issues uh, so they put aside their narrow agendas for a broader vision and and eventually implemented uh, a strategic plan for moving forward for the hospital. And they are also on a good trajectory. Uh, they will um, become part of a very reputable and strong regional presence uh, in their market, and, and, and they will have a, a really good outcome uh, uh, as a result of some of the initiatives that, that they undertook. Um, with with our guidance and, and suggestions. Thank you, um, Doug, for for summarizing uh, those um, very very nicely. Um, what what Doug and and I want also to make sure we do is is leave you with some best practices or thoughts about how um, you can, with your respective organizations, think about uh, mitigating um, some of the the conflict or distrust that may have emerged over years. Um, and so some of the best practices that we've seen, um, and they're alluded to in some of these, these case studies, first being uh, it's really important to have an educated board, uh, one that can appreciate uh, certainly trends uh, and some of the constraints and opportunities that, that confront the organization, um, but also has a, a, an understanding of the strategic risks facing the hospital. Uh, and this is an area we'll highlight a little later. I think it's an area where lots of boards struggle. Um, they get a lot of the other things right, but strategic risk is a pretty um, uh, elusive concept and one that can be hard to make part of a, a, a once a year agenda for the board to assess the strategic risk factors facing a hospital. Um, but we think it's a hallmark of, of good governance and, and um, we'll, we'll explain why. Certainly developing a common fact base. Um, you want to understand what some of the performance gaps are, what the risk factors are, but that common fact base is also really important for um, de-escalating 
some of the emotions that may be driving decisions and perceptions uh, between boards and various camps and a community. Um, one of the opportunities, and Doug alluded it to in, in the last case study, um, is the, the importance of, of developing a venue where key stakeholders, key leaders from whether it's the county or the district and the hospital can meet and discuss and address these issues. If you don't have that venue and a regular format for it, it's really nearly impossible to develop the kind of working relationships and trust that needs to be developed to be effective. Um, and so um, once you do that, uh, D Doug's other point that I think he really uh, illuminated very well is the importance of having good leaders that can rise above some of the history, some of the past grievances, and, and really instrumental in doing that is having that venue where folks can come together and build those working relationships. Um, I think one of the things that's important to note around the future direction of a local hospital, oftentimes um, if you wait until everybody in the room is unanimous on the direction, you may have waited too long. And by that, you may have missed out on opportunities or you may have waited until it was glaringly obvious that something needed to happen. Uh, and so we think it's better to try to forge consensus. Obviously, if you can get to unanimity, that's great. But if there's a couple of folks that for whatever reason see things differently, but there's a clear consensus on a direction, that shouldn't hold you back. And you really need to appeal to the folks that are dissenters to say, we respect your dissent, but there's consensus about moving forward and we need to do that. Otherwise, we're putting the organization and, and local delivery of healthcare at risk. Um, developing a shared vision for the future is really critical for um, creating alignment and getting folks on board and to buy into what you want to do. Um, and it's really important to engage key stakeholders. Without items two, three, and four on this list, common fact base, that, that, that venue or task force for communication and developing a shared vision, item number five is not nearly as effective, but it is essential. If you've done the groundwork on, on the, the previous four items, then making sure you have an effective communication strategy um, to engage stakeholders and keep the vision uh, and that shared vision in front of folks really is critical because there will be points where negativity will start to creep back in and folks will be critical. And so it's important to have a pos positive message and be on message uh, as you move forward with, with the future of the local healthcare uh, delivery system. Lastly, um, one of the things we see is, is boards and senior leadership getting distracted by what are very distracting events, a public debate, a public dispute, or even private disputes between key board members uh, of various boards can be very distracting. And so it's really important that um, everybody in the organization not get distracted from uh, focusing on operations and implementing strategy. These are, in our estimation, the key uh, best practices for overcoming uh, contentious or fractious relationships between county and hospital or district and hospital um, uh, boards. Some additional um, lessons learned. Um, triggering events that can often create a crisis or a, an eruption, a public eruption of dissent and dispute uh, and conflict. Uh, eroding hospital operating performance can be the catalyst. Uh, the decision to reduce hospital services in, in light of shortages of healthcare professionals and in light of the need to um, conserve scarce resources and focus on core functions, that can be a source of um, real blowback in a community and often can be uh, the, the spark that, that lights the fire. Um, lastly, we've certainly seen uh, circumstances where uh, there's a contentious issue around medical staff or employees, and those emerge into the public and um, become the, the, again, that spark that um, starts a much larger fire. Those are often the triggering events. The bullets underneath this are important factors that often create the risk or that, to use the, the fire analogy, the dry tinder that can start that conflagration. 
So if hospital and management resist questions posed by county officials, um, the flip side of that is, is if every management decision is debated or second guessed by public officials, that can become a real source of strife and conflict. So there's two sides of that equation. If there are differing risk tolerances or perceptions of risk held by the hospital management and board versus county or district officials, that can be a source of tension going forward. Certainly personal agendas and histories uh, can drive senses of grievance uh, and the need to address uh, issues, and that can become uh, a distraction and a source of tension and conflict going forward. Uh, and lastly, one of the things we've seen is, you know, a lack of transparency, poor communications, um, that there just isn't any kind of communication between, say, the hospital board and the county. Those can all be um, chronic and, and exacerbate things. And then longstanding personal or familial conflicts can undermine that trust. So all of those um, play a role. Again, the triggering events are usually some sort of crisis that emerge, e either around operations, services that are available, or something related to medical staff relations or employee issues, but not always. Those other issues that are more chronic and long-term can fester and bubble to the surface as well. As we think about hospital boards, uh, and this really is, um, legal advice to hospital boards, but it, I think it's useful as well um, if, if you're on the county or the district side to keep these in, in mind. In our experience, um, hospital boards um, do a good job with some of these responsibilities and not, not so much with, with some of the others. And what I mean by that is if the hospital board isn't functioning at a high level, the two areas we highlight below are often the two areas where um, they've, they've not performed um, uh, to their responsibilities. As many of you are aware, there are fiduciary responsibilities of the board, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. Um, all of you have heard that. It's about taking the appropriate level of care, making sure that you put the organization's interests ahead of any personal interest, um, and making sure that um, you then also are an effective um, advocate and um, um, resource for the organization going forward as it moves uh, to execute a strategic plan. But boards have the following kind of organizational functions, selecting, monitoring, and evaluating uh, the CEO, evaluating compensation as well, defining, reevaluating, and monitoring long-term strategy by which the organization fulfills its mission. This is an area where we see some boards um, not taking the time, not having the agenda to do that, uh, on an annual basis. How are we doing? Are we on track? Where are we off track? What do we need to, ch to change the direction of the organization? That's one problem area that we, we see more often than others. Approving budgets, financials, financial statements, uh, making sure that the financial uh, reporting and processes have integrity, uh, et cetera, is a key legal responsibility. Another area where we find boards falling down occasionally uh, and, and perhaps more frequently than, than we certainly would like to see, is making sure that the board understands the organization's risk profile and that they review and oversee the organization's management of risks. We'll spend a little bit of time later talking about risk profile and what we mean by that, but that, again, is a fairly elusive concept and, again, one that many boards don't take time on an annual basis to appreciate and engage with management around. Um, Ensuring compliance with all applicable laws, re laws, regulations, and policies and ethical standards. This is an area of immense complexity and challenge. Um, in our experience, most boards are um, doing you know, their best as our management teams in, in this space. The complexity of the compliance uh, requirements in healthcare today, though, can over, overcome the systems and the procedures in place in some organizations. So it, it is something certainly to keep one's eye on. And then establishing the composition of the board and its committees and determining governance practices. But the two highlighted in red here are areas where we do find um, boards sometimes struggle. And so Kimberly has a question she'd like to pose. I do, thank you, Jeff. Um, given those blind spots, we're interested in how well you think that your board monitors progress on your long-term strategic goals. Um, not at all, not paying attention, uh, pretty well, but you could do better, 
or very well, um, you're right on top of it. We'll just give that a moment and collect the responses there. Thank you. Um, it looks like most of you on the phone are coming right in the middle there. So um, you think you're doing a decent job, but you know that there is opportunity for you to do better. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. This slide um, is, is a Texas client of ours. It's not one of, again, the case studies we shared, um, and it's blinded. Um, but this is an organization that you that was doing reasonably well. And what this, this chart wants to show is what are operating results and in this case each vertical bar there the gray bars are um, EBITDA which is um, earnings before interest depreciation and amortization it's a measure of cash flow and those bars those vertical bars are then set against various performance thresholds the red line or performance threshold the survive line means are we generating enough cash flow to pay debt service you can see in 13 14 and 15 well above that survive line. Um, the next threshold, the orange line, is what we call the sustain line. Do, are you generating enough cash flow to pay debt service and replace or fund depreci annual depreciation at 120% of depreciation? And this is a measure of an organization's ability to replenish and renew its asset base, renew, replace biomedical equipment, invest in, in um, uh, new imaging as it's ends its useful life, et cetera. And you can see here, they were short of that threshold in 13, above it in 14, and then started to decline markedly in, in 15, and then continue. And then there's, there's a thrive threshold above that, which is, are you generating cash flow to not only replace your existing assets, but, but do some major strategic initiatives? And you can see they fell well short of that. The point of this chart from our perspective is that many boards do not have access to you know, multi-year trends of performance. And this is a way to evaluate operating results within a strategic context. Are we generating ample cash flow to renew our asset base? Obviously, if you're throwing, falling below that orange line, the organization is in no immediate danger, but if year after year after year goes by and you're not able to fund depreciation, your asset base is eroding. Um, the average age of your physical plant um, will increase, and that creates risk for an organization. In this case, we wanted to show the trajectory here because, you know, this is a fairly steep trajectory. Over the course of two years, they went from above the sustained threshold. Everything is going well. We're able to fund depreciation at 120% and then some to being two years later below the survive threshold. And this gives you an idea of, of the timeline that can occur. Oftentimes, it's more gradual but um, we are in a very dynamic environment. So as we step and think about strategic risk, this is, this is how we begin to think about your strategic risk profile. Um, and key point here is that it's quite dynamic. Um, and while the changes may go unremarked year to year, many boards don't appreciate the cumulative effects of erosion and degradation of various risk factors across these four vectors of risk, financial results, operating performance, the market position of the organization, and then a fourth a vector, which is somewhat new, value. And it goes back to that value chart that Doug shared earlier. How well is the organization positioned to deliver high quality health care that's also cost effective? Um, and that is important because a lot of payment um, modalities now uh, do have pay for performance, pay for quality and do put an organization somewhat at risk, either for the care of populations or the care and the cost of an episode of care. Um, so important to note that these vectors of risk aren't separate, they're interrelated. So if, if there's an, something that occurs in the operating sphere, it likely will have spillover in the financial um, uh, vector as well. There, there are in, uh, interrelated and ties to them. Um, when we think about a strategic risk profile, what we're thinking about is how well does an organization perform on certain key metrics? And again, what we've done here is tried to highlight some metrics that speak to each of these risk vectors. And it's important to note not just how you're doing at a given snapshot, but what the trend looks like over a three-year, preferably five-year timeline, um, and understanding how that how that movement and the direction of that movement is important, and, and ultimately, 
what's the organization's ability to respond to a, a deterioration in the risk profile or something that happens externally. Um, so this is uh, what we mean when we talk about a risk profile. And Kimberly, I think, has a question for folks. Yes. Um, uh, speaking of risk profile, how would you rate um, your organization's understanding of its risk profile? Um, not at all. Um, pretty well, but we could always do better or extremely well. We'll give that a moment for people to punch in their responses before we tabulate. Okay, great. Um, again, it looks like our audience runs right to the middle here. So th they are doing it as a matter of course, but they know they could do better. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so our final slide of content, we wanted to leave you with four things to remember um, if there are four takeaways from this, this webinar and our time with you today. Um, the first is if you've got this split governance model between a district and a 501c3 board or a county and a 501c3 board or some variation on that theme, creating some sort of venue, whether it's a joint committee or task force, so that key leaders um, from those two boards can get together and review information and communicate uh, is really important. Obviously, if you're at some point where the relationship is in crisis, um, you know, that's a, an immediate need and probably needs to have a, 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 a fairly frequent touch base and you need to be very thoughtful about how you um, structure those meetings. If it's something that you want to just mitigate this risk and head off um, a, a, a full breach in the relationship, then um, you know certainly structuring that initial meeting, but the cadence of those meetings can be less regular. Um, developing an objective set of analyses, findings, and recommendations so that key leaders can focus on facts and not emotion or perception. That's really important. We, you need to de-escalate the emotions, de-escalate the sense of grievance, and really focus on the challenge that's ahead of the organization and the community. And that's, that's a set of, of uh, objectives that I think most folks can get behind. And it really leads to the third uh, thing to remember, which is one of the most powerful things you can do if you're trying to engage um, a board, whether you sit on the county or district side or the 501c3, um, side of the equation is to develop a, a thoughtful shared vision for what healthcare delivery locally should be. Um, if, if you can develop that uh, and folks commit to working towards that and you have a good process behind it, um, you can accomplish a great deal. And I think that is one of the key differentiators in our experience between communities that, that uh, really destroy a lot of value and a lot of standing of the local healthcare delivery system before they arrive at a solution versus those that are able to problem solve and not destroy a lot of value and a lot of the standing of the local hospital before they arrive at a solution. So that's really critical. Um, the last thing I would say, and I'm gratified the response to the polling question that some of you are doing this, but you could do better. It's really critical that as leaders and stakeholders, man, senior management, and board is that you appreciate your organization's risk profile and you understand how it's changing. And, and when I say changing, that's not month to month, but I do think that the cadence of, of revisiting those issues is it's appropriate to do it annually. Um, and if you wait longer than that, you can really see an erosion of the organization's uh, market position and ability to deliver quality cost-effective care. The last thought I'll leave you with um, is that the most common regret we hear from organizations that we come in and work with and work through these issues is, I wish we'd started this conversation two years ago. Uh, because ultimately, um, those stakeholders become aware of, hey, there is a shared vision here. And if we'd started this process two years ago, we'd be that much further along and we wouldn't have dragged ourselves and the community and the uh, local medical center through the mud. Um, Thank you for your time today. Um, we're almost at our limit. Um, there's some contact information for Doug and I, should any of you have questions or like to follow up. Um, Kimberly, do we have any questions that we've, we've gotten from folks? Yeah, I think we have time just to
squeak in one. Um, and the question is, um, you know, we're speaking to a Texas audience today. Stroudwater works nationally. What do you find is the critical factor that most impacts an organization's um, strategic risk profile? Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, as I, I, I'm going to go back to um, th this slide um, to kind of ground us a little bit. Um, I think for our current environment in most markets, the, the greatest risk vectors are on the financial and operating side. Um, those remain really front and center. Um, I think depending upon the market, and if you're in a suburban market or a more urban market, there's more competition, and that competition can be quite dynamic. But in certainly in more rural markets, I think the market risk indicators in terms of market share and competition tends to be um, a, a little lower. The one that's really emerging, and I think uh, is an emerging set of risks for a lot of the organizations we work with, it, are the value risk indicators, because that's where payment is going. And understanding your quality scores and how to manage those and improve those is critical. Uh, your cost position. And the last bullet there, which is retail pricing. Folks, because of high deductible health plans, are shopping for care. I know where the cheapest place in town is to get a CT or an MRI if I or a family member needs it. And um, I can assure you that that your um, residents of your community understand that too. You know, I can travel an hour and and get that that diagnostic exam done. So um, I think the risk profile is changing. It varies by type of organization, um, but in general, you know, I think financial risk indicators and operating risk indicators are often where most of the clients we see get into trouble. Um, and then it's exacerbated um, by other factors, whether that be value or some of the market factors. Thank you so much. Um, well, with that, um, we want to be respectful of your time today. Um, we appreciate you joining us for this hour, and I will be sending you the presentation um, as well as the slides uh, later this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you all.